What up y'all? Just want to make a quick video to show you what I've been working on. And I know I already made a tutorial series about this, but things have evolved since that plant watering idea. So starting again from the top, this is TNB OS. And yes, of course, it's not an actual operating system. It's actually a desktop client built with Electron and React. And it allows your computer to communicate with any other computer running TNB OS. And that's it. What you build from there is really up to you. Now, so far we got five apps built, well, seven if you include these system apps, but five uh, user-facing apps, I would say. And we'll take a look at these in just a bit. But first, let's go ahead and do a quick review of the network architecture. So at the heart of everything is gonna be our core server. And the purpose of the server is really just to allow our client devices to connect to kind of like this, so that they can communicate with one another. So basically acting as a router between devices. Now, I already made a tutorial on how to set this up, configure everything, and I'll leave a link to that video in the description below. And I also wrote up a Google Doc guide if anyone would prefer that. But either way, once you have your core server up and running, let's go ahead and connect to it using TNB OS. So first things first, how do we get TNB OS? Well, if you go to this URL, which is also going to be in the description below, but if you go to github.com slash the new Boston, Boston, Boston hyphen developer slash TNBOS, then it's going to take you here and to, again, you probably want to clone it. And then to set it up, it's a piece of cake, pretty much like any other JavaScript project. Just run npm install, npm start, and then this thing right here is going to pop open you're actually gonna have a welcome modal that pops up. You can just go ahead and dismiss that. I'll talk you through everything in this video. But what we're trying to do first is just connect to that core server that we have set up. So how do we do that? Excellent question. If you go ahead and click this icon on the bottom right, this network icon, this is gonna pop open your network manager. And from here, we're gonna click add a network, basically like adding a core server and then we just put in the info for that core server. The network ID, this is just gonna be the domain name. So mine is on the newboston.network protocol, HTTPS. Now for the port, we don't need to fill out anything. That's just gonna default to 443 based on this protocol. In the display name, you can just create a shorthand version of, usually I like to you know make it similar to the network ID, but you know more readable version of that. And for the logo URL, pretty much just uh, have any image that represents your network, hit submit, and there you go. And you can tell by the green little indicator right here that we are indeed connected. So just to kind of keep this diagram updated, what we pretty much did right here is the equivalent of this connection, just like that. Now, whenever you first booted up TNBOS, it generated an account for you and that includes an account number that you can see by clicking on this little QR icon on the bottom right. Now you can go ahead and copy that because we're gonna need it in just a bit. However, one other thing I wanna mention real quick is that in addition to that, each core that we connect to, it's also gonna maintain what's called a credit balance for your account. Now this represents the number of messages that this device can send using that core so on that note, before we can start sending data to other devices, we're gonna to need to go in Django Admin and credit this account. So again, make sure that you have this account number copied and pop open Django Admin and just go to Accounts. Actually, let me move this so you can see. Actually, let me do this. I'm gonna go ahead and hit Add Account and then paste in that account number. I'll do 10,000. Now, before I hit Save and Continue, what I wanna do is this, keep an eye on this balance right here because I'm about to hit save and continue. And you see whenever I do, that your balance is gonna update in real time. Pretty sweet, huh? All right. So now that we have some credits, let's go ahead and connect to my MacBook. So just, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but right now I'm on my iMac and uh, sitting right to the right of me is my MacBook and throughout this video, I'll just be using these two devices to kind of communicate back and forth and show you all the features of a uh, TNBOS. So on that note, let's go ahead and open this app, which is the account manager. 
and I'm gonna add my MacBooks account. I already have the account number copied, display name. I'll just write MacBook, and I already have the avatar URL for this as well. So boom, look at that. Easy, easy, nice and cheesy. We are now connected to my MacBook. Where's that diagram? Let me keep this updated. So now we got this architecture going, looking good. And believe it or not, we're all set up, ready to start using apps. However, before we do, there is one last important concept that we need to cover, and that's the ability to connect to other devices through multiple cores. So what am I talking about? Well, although it isn't 100% necessary, whenever you connect to devices through multiple cores, it does improve fault tolerance. So what am I talking about? Well, right now, we already have this structure right here. I am connected to my MacBook through this uh, TNB core. Now, I also have another core that I spun up that I'll connect to in just a bit. It's called Vitaxia.io, and it's just the uh, VTX I'm using for the shorthand. But check this out. Because what this system allows for is for me to connect to other devices through more than one core, if let's say this TNB network ever goes offline, I'll still have a way to connect to or communicate with these other devices. So again, like I said, it isn't absolutely necessary to use this since this form of communication is fine, just one core. However, it does allow for some increased fault tolerance, which I don't know, I thought was a pretty cool feature. So let's actually connect to it right now. No use just talking about it. So the network ID is taxia.io protocol. HTTPS, VTX, and there's my logo. All right, looking good. Now I already have a balance in there because I credited this account before this tutorial, so I don't need to go in Django Admin and do it again. So now let's go ahead and finally take a look at some of these apps that we built. And let's go ahead and get things started with this speed test app. All right, so for those who didn't follow along with the last tutorial series, this is what we built, the speed test app, and it's kind of like the Hello World app for this architecture because what it uses is a very simple ping pong protocol to pretty much find the fastest connection between two devices. And I'll show you what I'm talking about right now. So you first select a device that you want and I'm gonna go ahead and select my MacBook. It's the only device I'm connected to. And then you can choose what network you want to connect through. And so let me go ahead and test the speed through the new Boston network, and then I'll test the speed through Vitaxia. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit this go button. And whenever I do, what this device is gonna do is it's gonna send a request, a ping request to this MacBook, and that MacBook is gonna send back a Pong request. And then this timer pretty much just, you know, calculates the total time it took, and there you go. So let me do a couple to get a good average right here. And all right, so, and let me show you in the diagram what's going on as well. All right, so right now I'm testing this connection, connecting through the new Boston network from my iMac to my MacBook. And on average, well, I don't know the average of this, maybe like a 0.8 or something. Uh, we got 1.1, 0.4, and somewhere around uh, half a second. So now let me go ahead and connect and see if this network is any faster. So let me go ahead and time this. All right, that one's pretty slow. All right, looks like uh, the same speed. Maybe VTX is just a little bit faster, but like I said, this is pretty much the point of the speed test app. It allows you to test connections and also the speed of those connections. And if you ever wanna clear your history, just uh, you can click this little icon and it'll delete all of your runs. And that's it, pretty simple app, but very useful as well. Now the next app we can check out is this chat app. Now also keep in mind that in this architecture, there's no centralized databases to store any of this app data. Instead, all of this app data is stored directly on the devices themselves. So just keep this in mind whenever we're chatting right here. And on that note, let me go ahead and create a new chat. Of course, I'm gonna be chatting with my MacBook. It's the only, only device I'm connected to right now. And this is a pretty, you know, standard chat application. You can send messages. Uh, you can well, edit messages. Hey there. Uh, you can delete messages. 
And what else can you do? You can uh, send credits as well. So let's say I want to send uh, 50 TNB. Like here are some credits. Uh, send you 50, just like that. And you can also, another core feature that I built is uh, if you click this little paper clip, you can attach accounts and also uh, networks. So let me, how can I demonstrate this? Actually, let me go ahead and do this. I'm going to go in my network manager and just delete this VTX network. And I want to show you this because what I'll do now is go on my MacBook and I'll send over this. So I'm going to send over the VTX network. I know you can't see this, but uh, and I'm also going to attach an account as well. So now let me send over these two. And all right, so oh, huh, looks like my grandma is using TNBOS as well. So right now, the MacBook sent me an account and this network that I just deleted. If I ever want to update it, like let's say, oh yes, I want this uh, network as well. I just have to click this button in the middle. And then there you go. You see that it is now added. And of course my accounts, let's see that. Oh, my grandma's online and I want to, of course, add her, chat with her. I can just click that and look at that. I now have my grandma's account. She actually isn't online at the moment. Maybe she's taking a nap or something, but there you go. So again, pretty simple chat application, but uh, I don't know. I thought it was pretty cool to make a, even a simple chat app without the use of any uh, middleman or intermediary. So yeah, pretty cool. What else do we got here? Let's take a look at the university app next. All right. So this, of course, is one of our pride and joys, uh, the university app. So, of course, this app is for creating, uh, organizing, sharing educational content with one another. And whenever I open this, you saw that there were these courses right here. So these are all courses that were created and are being hosted from my MacBook. And you can, you know, pretty much just like any other uh, um, educational platform, you can click into one of these courses and you can take the course. And whenever you take a course, what it does is it just moves it from this browse section to my courses, pretty much just for like better organization. Uh, you can also clone the course. And what this does is, well, you'll see in just a bit. Let me get back to this. Don't want to throw too many things at once. Now for any of these courses, you can of course just click into the lecture and you can watch it. It uh, has some responsive behavior right here, although I'm seeing right now that this view is probably a little bit too small with the video, so I'm gonna work on that. But either way, uh, back to this cloning courses logic. Whenever you clone a course, what it does is it pretty much copies the course over as your own course. So as a teacher, you can create your own or you can clone. Those are two ways to kind of uh, create your own courses. So most of the time you are going to be creating your own. However, I found whenever you're like working on a course with someone else that the clone logic was uh, just useful. But either way, once you have a course, you can just go ahead and edit it. It won't be live to other devices until you publish it. So I'm not going to publish that because this is already being hosted for my MacBook. Uh, another thing I just want to show you is that your lectures right here. If you ever want to create a new one or edit one, then there you go. And also you can uh, sort your lectures. If you ever want to do that, made this nice little sorting logic. And uh, yeah, there you go. Now, just a heads up as well. Whenever a course is published, then any changes to that course are going to be reflected on any other devices in real time. So for example, say that my MacBook was editing this course to change the uh, name of it. Let me just say Python uh, bacon or something. And on my MacBook, let me go ahead and submit those changes. Right now, you see that this updated to Python bacon. And if I ever unpublish that course, let me unpublish it from my MacBook then it's just gonna disappear from my, uh, well, any other device. So just want to uh, point that out because if you have a course published and then you're making changes to it, 
then just note that on everyone else's devices, then they're gonna see all those changes in real time. So I would highly recommend unpublishing it, making all your changes, and then publish it whenever it's ready. But either way, that is the university app. Next up, let's go ahead and take a look at the shop app. Now the shop app is a cool way that you can exchange goods with your you know, friends and family without the use of any intermediary. And on that note, let's go ahead and see what we got available right here. See some cool t-shirts. Ooh, the classic one. I think I might have to snag this one. All right. And let me see what else I got. I think I got like 10,000 credits. So, ooh, Wavelength. This is actually a pretty cool game. Mushroom Book. Fun fact, the network architecture is largely inspired off of the mycelium network or the... uh mushroom network and let's see if there's anything else Ooh, old man carving this is pretty cool but don't think i can afford that let me go ahead and uh this is a tough decision okay let me go ahead and get these uh, elephant figurines all right now before i can go ahead and check out i need to go ahead and add my address so let me go ahead and do that add address say bucket roberts United States of America, and there you go. Address added now, if I go to my checkout, it's gonna default to this, but if you have more, then it's gonna allow you to select them. But since I only have one, it knows to use that as a default. And now that everything looks good, let me go ahead and place this order. Now, whenever I do, I'm gonna be taken to my orders page, and you can see that we already have a couple things that were, well, they're actually done really quickly. But um, what happened behind the scenes is that whenever I made that order, what I did is I created this order object and I sent it over to my MacBook. Now my MacBook looked at everything, make sure that you know it, all the data matched up. Uh, I wasn't trying to get this shirt for like only a thousand credits or anything. And then once it approved everything, it sent me back that approval status and it also sent me this receiving address. Now, why do we have another receiving address when I could just send the credits to that account directly? Well, the reason is this. Let's say that the MacBook approved the order and then while it was waiting for me to send my payment, that MacBook, it just went offline. Well, then I would send the payment and the MacBook would never receive it. Even when it came online, it might have some more credits in the account, but you know, where did those credits come from? So things can become kind of confusing this way. Whereas with this architecture, what happens is whenever there's a separate receiving address, then let's say my MacBook approved that order and then it went offline. Well, now instead of sending it to the MacBook's address, I would send it to this address. Now, whenever that MacBook came back online, all it needs to do is it needs to check this address and as long as there are the 5,000 credits in there, then it knows that this payment has been made. So again, this really shouldn't happen because all of this happens in a fraction of a second, but just in the weird edge case that the MacBook goes offline the moment right after it proves, which again is very rare, but this is just you know a little safety procedure in place for that. But yeah, as you can see, I sent the 5,000 TNB and now I just pretty much sit back and wait to receive my elephant figurines and t-shirt. Looking forward to that. Now, another cool feature that uh, I just want to point out is that since these items have been purchased, if I go back to buy, you see that they are no longer available. And this is just some automated behavior that my MacBook automatically like takes them out of their inventory uh, whenever they've been purchased. So now let's go on the flip side of this and see how to sell items. So of course, you can go to the sell section right here and then you can just add a product and what i am going to be adding is one of the hand carved wooden spoons that i created and i'll say fantastic wooden spoon and this is my image url i want to receive tnb and how much is this gonna be worth? I'd say about 800 credits. So check it out. This, <laughs> this is actually um, a wooden spoon that I carved. 
I saw like a Netflix show or a YouTube video, I can't even remember now, about uh, wooding, like wood carvings. So I bought this wood spoon carving kit off Amazon and uh, well, this is the result of it. I would not recommend actually eating with it. I'm pretty sure that you'd just get a ton of splinters in your mouth, but this is the first ever, <laughs> probably the only wooden spoon I'm ever gonna carve, but let me go ahead and activate that bad boy right now and all right. So now this one spoon is for sale by me. Of course, if I ever wanna delete it, deactivate it, edit it, yada yada, all this is uh, pretty intuitive. And of course, in your orders, you can see uh, any orders that you may have. So I have some in there from before and, oh, look at this, a new one. It looks like my MacBook just bought my one spoon. So look at this. My MacBook putting those credits to use already. Very cool. And now since my MacBook did just buy this, you can see under products right here, then it pretty much removes it from the inventory. And that just makes sure that like uh, it can't be purchased twice. So there you go. While I am waiting for my elephant figurines and t-shirt, I will be shipping this one spoon to sample buyer. And I am sure they're gonna be very happy with this incredibly high quality one spoon. So that is pretty much the shop app. And on that note, let's go ahead and take a look at this last app, which is Trade. So check it out. Now, once users find the fastest connection using this speed test app, what you can do is you can actually help them out by allowing them to exchange credits. So how does this work? Well, let's say that I wanna allow other devices to exchange their credits. For example, trade TNB for VTX or VTX for DNB, any other ones that we're connected to, so on and so forth. Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go under this automated section to offers, and I'm first gonna make sure that I have this TNB is my active network. This is kind of like the uh, base network that everything is everything else is done in relation to. And you'll see what I mean in just a second. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit offer terms, and I'm gonna select offer terms for VTX. Now, what I'm saying is I'm gonna allow you to exchange VTX for a TNB. Now, the purchase price for each VTX, I'll just keep it simple and say one TNB per one VTX. Now, for the order minimum, let me just go ahead and do 10, and as the maximum, I'll do 10,000. And for the sale price is the same, whether you want VTX or whether you want TNB, again, it's just a one for one, order minimum 10, order maximum 10,000. All right, looking good. So now for this automation that I'm setting up, let me go ahead and just review everything. Purchase term looking good. So all that's good, I'm gonna enable buying. And if all my sale terms look good, I'm gonna enable automated selling. So now this is all set up where other devices can now trade either VTX for TNB or TNB for VTX. Now, to demonstrate what this is like from the other devices perspective, what I'm gonna do is go to this manual section right here. Now, I already set it up in the exact same way on my MacBook. So again, this is just like the uh, um, flip side perspective of it, where let's say that I wanted to trade, uh, let's say that I wanna trade some of my TNB and I wanted to receive VTX. So I would go buy, and I would just click buy VTX. And how much did I want? Well, let's say that I wanted uh, 260 VTX and that was gonna cost me 260 TNB. Well, what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna hit place purchase order. And whenever I do this, you see that a couple things happen right here, but more or less uh, at the end of the day, I received VTX and I sent them TNB. And if you're keeping an eye on my balance right here, you probably noticed that that updated too. Now, just real quick, I wanna talk about how this is working. And it's kind of similar to the shop logic, but a little, a few more steps in way. So more or less what I did is when I was about to purchase right here, what I'm looking at right here is their offer terms. Now, whenever I buy this, what I'm doing is I'm creating an order. So, once I have the order created, I then take that object and I send it over to my MacBook. My MacBook, who is the host in this example, they're gonna review everything. 
basically to make sure that the terms of the order match whatever terms that they had in their offer and that you know they have enough credits to fill the order, so on and so forth. But either way, once everything is approved, then they're gonna go ahead and mark the order as approved and also create that receiving address and send that both back over to me. So at this point, it's basically like, yeah, everything looked good. Here's my receiving address. Go ahead and send 260 TNB to this account. Now I did that and by I, I mean, you know, this is all automated, happens quickly in the background. But now my iMac went ahead and it sent 260 TNB to this receiving address. And then once it did, I notified the MacBook again, hey, I sent that TNB, uh, go ahead and check it. It checked it, saw that there was indeed that amount in there and it went ahead and then filled my order. Now by filling the order, of course this means sending VTX to my receiving address and that's what this transaction is right here. So actually this transaction is the final transaction where it takes it from my receiving address and moves it to my main account and that's why you see it has 258 here instead of 260. And that's because although my MacBook did indeed send 260 credits, one of those credits were pretty much used as a transaction fee for sending it to this receiving address. And then whenever I moved those funds from the receiving address to my main account, that was another one credit transaction fee. So that's why at the end of this, I only end up with 258 rather than 260 but you get the point. So that's the main functionality of this trade app. Again, pretty much to allow other devices to uh, trade whatever credits they want for faster credits, usually determined by the speed test app. And I also have this uh, little wallet section right here. So under this wallet section, you can pretty much choose uh, which network, and then you can view the transactions for that network you can also send and receive, but most of the time this is just gonna be automated based on this manual or automated uh, trading logic. But yeah, there you go. And before I let you guys go, I do want to talk very quickly about some items that we have on our roadmap. Now the first one, this is just a rumor, just wanna throw this out there. Nothing is confirmed, but I've been hearing a rumor that we may be working on a social network pretty soon. I think it's a good idea. Still got to talk with the Subcoins team to figure out exactly uh, what's going on, when we can uh, get started on this. But I thought it was a very good idea, pretty much a way to connect to the people that you know and trust and also give users control over their own data. So really uh, looking forward to this. Now, in addition to this, we're also going to be introducing something called services and I'm super excited about this. So it's a simple concept, but it's gonna allow us to build some very awesome apps. Now all a service is, is just an automated program that we can interact with remotely. Now we are actually finishing up a Python library for this, which is gonna make these super easy to build. And I'm guessing that should be ready in a few weeks is my estimate. And I'll let you guys know whenever it's uh, complete, but really services can be written in any language. Now the most basic example of a simple service would just be a program that consists of a single function that can be called remotely. For example, if this device was you know, running an app or some program and they wanted a random number, it can make a request to say get random number and then this device would respond with it. I imagine most of these are probably gonna be ran on like a Raspberry Pi or something that can be online all the time without having to keep your uh, laptop open. But really, since they're like programs that you can run them on your desktop, your laptop, a Pi, whatever. So this would be a very basic service, but let me copy this. But you can have more complicated ones as well. So say that we were making, I don't know, like a, a chat bot service. That's what this was right here. Let me connect it to my little, whoa, don't want those kind. Where are the straight line? There we go. So let's say that this is a chatbot service. What functions might a chatbot have? Um, I don't know, say this chatbot is a game where you can, I don't know, buy corn. And what else could you do in this game? Uh, maybe you could, I guess you could eat corn if you could buy it. And maybe this like gives you energy or something. 
what else could you do? I suppose you, if you could buy corn, you could probably sell corn. You know what? I can't really think of any non-corn related examples right now, but I'm sure you get the point. Now, another service, just to kind of, uh, I don't know, I like brainstorming what all these services can do. Let's say that we have another service that could be like an Ethereum API, I like this example. So let me delete these and show you what I'm talking about. So let's say that we wanted to have a service to connect with the Ethereum network. Now, of course, this would still be connected to the new Boston network. And let me just make a, like a little bridge. Some somehow show it's connected to the uh, Ethereum network. But let's say that this device was not only connected to the new Boston network, but the Ethereum network as well. It could offer a service to pretty much provide any Ethereum data to any of these devices as well. For example, like fetch um, address balance. Uh, you can also, what's a useful thing? Like get uh, gas price. Since if you wanna send a transaction, you, you need to know the current gas price, uh, so on and so forth. Just really trying to demonstrate that these devices can act as a bridge to other networks as well. Now, in addition to these, let me expand my network a little bit. So this looks kind of wonky. All right, let's connect these to a VTX as well. All right. So what other service could we have? Um, well, we could have, get out of here thing. Well, we could have a service that hosts a chess game. Let's say that uh, some of these devices wanted to play chess. Then this bad boy right here could host the chess game. And by the way, you can also run multiple services just on a single device. I just, uh, I don't know, don't wanna, I thought it was easier to explain visually this way. And another cool idea that I had for a service because in a way, so far, these services kind of act like uh, mini microservices or like mini servers or APIs or something. But because of the nature of how everything is set up, it doesn't always have to be that you request data and then it sends it back. Like um, you request some Ethereum data and then it sends you back the gas price. What you can do with these services as well is have them push out information. For example, Let's say that uh, you had a service that was um, tied to like some MMA data server. Whenever someone won an MMA fight, you could have it broadcast the results of that to all other devices. Or maybe send out notifications whenever someone scores a goal in the World Cup game. So again, it doesn't always have to be that you request something and it sends it back. It can also push out data as well. Now, as the creator of a service, you can get to decide if you wanna offer your service for free just to help out the community, or if you wanna charge credits for your service. Now, charging credits might be a good idea if your service is computationally expensive. And in that way, the fee is gonna act as a throttle. And some examples of this would be like, let's say that your service is gonna store data for other machines, or maybe you have a service that you send data to and it processes it for like machine learning or AI learning or something like that. Well, since those are computationally expensive operations, you probably don't wanna offer these for free. I mean, that'd be cool if you do just for the community, but I'm guessing that you probably wanna stick a fee on that just to act as a throttle, just so things don't you know get out of control. So yeah, I know, <laughs> well, look at this now, it seems like we started out creating a plant watering device ended up creating the singularity, but whatever. I mean, that's cool too. So on that note, that's probably good for this video. If anyone has any suggestions on how I can improve the UI, then I would love to hear it. Also, if anyone has any ideas for apps or other services that we could build, then feel free to uh, let me know. I would love to hear them. And for those interested in app development, Check out my React, Redux, and Electron tutorials. They are pretty much like 
TNBOS app development tutorials because what we do is we go through and we build this speed test app which gives you like all the fundamental knowledge to build other apps as well. And yeah, I think, uh, I think that's all we needed to cover. So thank you all for watching and yeah, I'll see you next time.